Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This is episode number nine of the Homestead Journey podcast. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on the Homestead Journey. I am recording this podcast the Sunday before Christmas, and I don't know about you, but for me, for some reason this year, Christmas just seems to, bam, I mean, it is here. And ready or not, it is here. (laughs) <laughs> it just seems like this year the the time between Thanksgiving and Christmas has been so short and I, I find myself not having gotten into the proper Christmas spirit. <laughs> now, I don't know really what that means, what it means to get in the Christmas spirit, but, uh, you know, usually I, I find myself coming into Christmas, you know, the carols and, and the Christmas music and all of that stuff and really having enjoyed that. And it just seems like, man, this year it has been so busy between things we have going on at work and just, I don't know, just a short time frame between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Man, it just, it it's, it's here. Uh, hard to believe. And then the end of the year, uh, it's hard to believe that we're going to be heading into 2020, a new decade and all of that just leaves me shaking my head. I, I guess as I get older, time just really seems to fly. And um, I, I'm, I'm starting to understand uh, that that song from the 80s, you know, stop the world, stop the world, I want to get off. Yeah, you know that song. Um, I, boy, I just wish sometimes that time would slow down. But it marches on, it waits for no one. And uh, so enough belly aching about that. I am very excited about Christmas coming up. Um, and we're going to be enjoying some of the... The, the bounty here from 3B Farm and Homestead uh, this Christmas. In fact, we're going to be going to my mom and dad's house Christmas Day, and they've asked us to bring one of our uh, chickens that we raised here on the homestead. And so very excited to um, bring that as our contribution. Actually, last year we had some uh, pork ribs that we smoked um, from uh, a pig that we processed here. It was the first pig that we'd ever processed. And I would kind of hoped to process a pig and do that again this year. And I just I didn't have time. Um, like I said, it just seems like, bam, between work and, and just the, all of the things that we have going on, I just didn't have time to do that. Um, but anyhow, we're heading into Christmas and I hope that uh, you are well and that um, your preparations for Christmas are going well and I would love to hear from you as far as what are some of the things that you are doing on your homestead this year what are some of the uh, what's some of the bounty that you grew or maybe processed on your homestead that you're going to be uh, enjoying this year um, uh, on your Christmas feast I would love to hear from you uh, about that so Drop me an email, thehomesteadjourneypodcast at gmail.com, and let me know what you are doing this year on your homestead, Um, how you're celebrating Christmas maybe with some of the things that you have produced or processed on your homestead. Well, let's jump right into this episode's homestead happenings. This week, we got the phone call that our pig was ready to be picked up. Um, I should say the pork from our pig (laughs) was ready to be picked up. And so I went up and got that. I I can't remember if it was Monday or Tuesday and uh, brought that home. Overall, just first impressions of how they packaged everything up. Very, very happy with it. It It's all vacuum packed up very nicely. Um, Our normal processor does the same thing. So it's not like they did a better job or a worse job than our normal processor, but Just seeing how they had vacuum packed everything up, very happy with that. Uh, Looking at the amount of meat that I got back versus the hanging weight of the pig, pretty satisfied as well with the yield. Um, One of the things that I I wish I would have done and I didn't do this time, I meant to do it and it slipped my mind, is I wanted to get the bones back to do bone broth. And uh, 
I forgot to ask for them. And so I'm kicking myself a little bit, but it's one of those things, the more you do it, the more you learn. And hopefully next time I will remember to ask for the bones back to make bone broth. Um, but this time I, I forgot to do that. So the only bones that we got back are the ones where we have bone in cuts, like our pork chops and some loin roasts and so forth. But overall, again, very happy with uh, the, at least the initial pass of, of how everything looks. I have not eaten any of it. I have not tasted their sausage versus our normal processor sausage. So excited about kind of doing a taste test between those, kind of uh, tasting the bacon and seeing which one I like or if I, if, whether I have a preference or not. Um, but at least the first pass, very happy with it. The other thing that was very nice is because I had taken a pig to the one processor, uh, like I, I think it was on a Monday, and I took um, then hours to the other processor on Thursday, I was able to get a feel for how much time it takes both of them to process a pig. And it was about the same amount of time. I think the one that I went to might have got it through a day or two quicker, but right about the same amount of time. And then they have two slightly different pricing structures. The one prices, you have, there's a per pound hanging weight charge, then they charge you uh, a kill and disposal charge, and they charge, uh, depending on how much you want smoked, there's a charge per pound on that. Uh, whereas the processor that we went to, pretty much everything is all included, it just costs more per pound. And so the pigs that we took were very, very similar in size. I think there was maybe a five pound difference between the two of them. And I compared notes with uh, my customer. And at the end of the day, the, the pricing was very, very similar. In fact, I also, when I was putting the pork away um, in the freezer, I happened to run across our uh, receipt from last year and it was, happened to be still in the box of some of the pork that we still had left. And so I was able to do the math there as well. And the, the, the cost was very, very similar um, between the two processors. So right now, as far as if I were to recommend one or the other to the customers, without having done the taste test, um, they're neck and neck. And so to me, it's probably going to be more about whether the customer has a preference where it goes and uh, whether or not I need the USDA. And then once I do the taste test, then I'll be able to maybe make a little bit of a better recommendation one way or the other. But right now I've been very happy with both of them. And so um, that makes me happy. <laughs> All right, the second major thing that we had happen here on the homestead this week was an unfortunate situation. And that is that back in August, um, one of my gilts broke through for the third time, unfortunately, and uh, got in with her dad and uh, was bred. The third time was a charm, and uh, so unfortunately, um, it was not good timing. Um, we ended up with a bit of, um, well, we ended up with a, a litter of pigs being born on the coldest uh, I should say the coldest day of the year so far because we're now in December. So I don't really remember what was going on back in January and, and February. But the coldest day so far this winter from 2019 into 2020. Uh, we got down to, I think it was six below. And that happened to be the day that she decided to have um, her litter. And so unfortunately we didn't, uh, well, we lost every pig, um, and they all froze to death. And, you know, my, my buddy says when you have livestock, you eventually going to have dead stock. And, and that's just a part of raising animals. But when, you know, again, as I said, it was the third time that she broke through in with her dad. You would have thought after the first, maybe after the second time, <laughs> I would have learned my lesson, but it, unfortunately, I'm a little bit of a thick skulled, a, a, a slow learner, I guess. And so um, I'm still in the process of reinforcing the fencing between the two. What I have right now is I have field fencing, which if you know anything about field fencing, it's not, a, unless it's stretched very, very tight, um, it's not exactly the sturdiest fencing that, that is out there. And just because of how my 
uh, paddocks are done, it my, my field fencing is not very, very tight. And so on either side of that, I have hot wire. But what would happen is they would push uh, debris up against the hot wire and ground it out. And then uh, they were going underneath it, underneath the uh, field fence and kind of crossing into the other paddock. So I'm in the process now of putting hog panels uh, up through there, just something a lot more rigid that they're not going to be able to kind of push up, nose up and get under. And hopefully uh, that will put an end to these unplanned pregnancies because I had one last year as well where I had one of the sows um, who got bred and unfortunately, or well, I should say fortunately, she had her litter um, when it was a little bit more temperate. I think it was we had a kind of an unseasonably warm stretch where we were up in the 40s and that's when she had uh, her litter and then at that point after a couple of days where they can kind of get used to regulating their body heat, then if it drops down, it gets cold. It's not that big of a deal. Um, unfortunately, uh, this crew was born when it was six below. And even though I had a heat lamp out there, it, it just wasn't enough. I don't have a barn to bring the pigs into. And uh, so I'm, I'm just doing this in, well, I have a hut that I've made out of pallets and plywood and some tin on top of it. Um, and that's where she was at. And it, it just wasn't. It wasn't a good situation, and so that's very, very disappointing, but hopefully I've learned my lesson, and uh, in the spring we will make sure that we have better fencing between the boar and the girls, and hopefully that will keep anything like this from happening again. The third thing that we had happen this week is I had one of my chickens get in with my geese, and thankfully my son was coming by when and saw they were kind of attacking this, this poor helpless chicken and was able to rescue it. And uh, so he brought it in, in the house. He, he cleaned it up, um, tried to get the blood off it as best he could. And now we have it in a dog crate that we have kind of, it's our chicken hospital. Um, I would recommend if you're raising chickens or any kind of livestock at all, uh, obviously smaller livestock, you know, bunnies, chickens, geese, ducks, those kinds of things, maybe even pigs. Um, to, to have a, a dog crate, we've got one of those plastic uh, dog carriers that you can put on the pl under the plane kind of things. Um, and uh, that sometimes is where we will have to quarantine an animal, uh, maybe if it's sick or injured. And uh, so that's where that hen is right now in the basement. Yesterday it was not looking good at all. But today she was uh, standing up. Uh, looks like she was eating and drinking. And so hopefully she's going to pull through and she'll be okay, but uh, that was a bit of a bummer. Um, she got in where she shouldn't have been, and uh, they kind of teamed up on her, and uh, so hopefully she's learned her lesson. All right, that's what's been happening here on uh, 3B Farm and Homestead. Again, very excited about Christmas coming up and being able to enjoy some of the bounty uh, from this year's hard work, and uh, I guess the last thing, I don't one other thing I've been doing here on the homestead this week is I've been starting to think forward to 2020 and I've been starting to jot down some of the ideas, some of the things that I'm thinking about uh, putting into the plan for 2020. And we'll spend more time talking about that uh, on next week's episode where we'll kind of do a look back on 2019, the things that went well, the things that didn't go so well, and then look forward to 2020 and think about some of the things that we may I'll take a crack at here on 3B Farm and Homestead. So excited about uh, that episode coming up next week. And so you're definitely not going to want to miss that. All right, let's go ahead and pop on over to this week's Community Corner. I think I shared with you several episodes ago that my mom uh, for Christmas subscribes to different homesteading magazines for my wife and I. And this week, my wife's Mary Jane Farm uh, magazine arrived. And I've got to be honest with you guys, I enjoy this, I think, as much as she does. Um, and so I was reading through it this week, and uh, one of the things that they are talking about in there is talking about handmade things that you can make uh, on your homestead to give away at Christmas time. Now, where I work at, everybody in our department uh, each year exchanges gifts. And I have, for the last several years, taken in 
homemade jams, jellies, relishes, and have given those away as gifts. And they seem to, well, they seem to be very well received. People really seem to enjoy and appreciate them. Now, I know a lot of people that do a lot of baking around the holidays and they share that with their neighbors and their friends and so forth. And I think that's great as well. Um, people that keep bees will give away honey. There's a lot of great things that you can do as a homesteader to make gifts uh, that you can then share with your friends and family. So if that's not been something that has been part of your homestead journey, um, I would really encourage you to think about that next year as you go through the year, as you are already preparing for um, 2020, you're thinking about the things that you're going to do on your homestead. I would urge you to think about ways that you can make gifts from things that you are producing on your homestead, whether it's jams and jellies, soap, honey, if you're into making knives, whatever it is, make a few extra, can a few extra, uh, and I think that you're going to be able to generate some goodwill within your community, whether it's within your church community, your family community, within your broader community, with your neighbors. Uh, but I really think, especially those people that have kind of questioned your sanity, so to speak, <laughs> the people that think you're a bit crazy for living this lifestyle, if you can somehow uh, share with them the things that you're passionate about, the things that you enjoy, um, you may begin to change their mind a little bit. Um, and if not, no big deal, no harm, no foul. You at least gave it a try. Uh, but I really think that some of these things um, that you're doing on your homestead, if, if you kind of make a few extra, You'll have them available for birthdays, Christmas, holidays, um, and I think people will really, really appreciate them, and it will further validate your homestead journey. All right, now it is time for this episode's Charting the Course segment, and on this episode, we are actually wrapping up our five-part series on gardening. Now, back in episode number five, we started out this series by talking about uh, the variety of gardening methods that are available to us to raise and grow uh, some of our own food. In episode number six, we talked about giving some thought to preparing for the harvest and how that can help us understand what to plant, how much to plant, and even when to plant. In episode number seven, we spent some time talking about the various ways that you can acquire seeds. In our last episode, I spent some time talking about buying or starting transplants and why you might choose to do one or the other. And so on this final episode of this gardening series, we are going to talk about weeds, pests, and varmints. <laughs> I love that word, varmint. It's a fun word to say. Anyhow, if you are new to gardening and your frame of reference, kind of your idea of gardening, is what you have seen on Pinterest and Instagram, then what you may not know is that if you decide to garden, you have decided to go to war. Now, that may be a little bit of an exaggeration, but there are some things that you are going to be battling as you try to raise and grow your own food. Besides the elements, you know, that it's too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, too windy, too much sun, not enough sun, and all of those things. Besides the elements, there are three things that want the nutrients and the space needed to grow the vegetables and the plants or some things that want the plants and the vegetables as much as you do. And that's those weeds, pests, and varmints. Now, certainly the particulars of how you battle each one of those things in a practical sense, is going to be vastly different. How you deal with tomato hornworms is different than how you're going to deal with deer 
which is different than how you are going to deal with quack grass. And there's certainly no way that I could ever deal with every possible weed, every possible um, varmint, every possible pest in a single episode. Uh, if I attempted to do that, the uh, show notes would be longer than Tolstoy's War and Peace. <laughs> but I do think that at a high level, there are four weapons uh, that are available to us as we take on the weeds, the pests, and the varmints that are seeking to invade our gardens. So the first weapon that I can think of is prevention. Now, the old adage is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and that is certainly true when it comes to gardening. So when I think about dealing with weeds, uh, a prevention method would be mulch, right? Uh, and there's, there's a variety of different kinds of mulches available to us. You could use black plastic, weed barriers, natural mulches such as uh, straw and hay and pine straw, wood chips, um, grass clippings. All of those are natural mulches uh, that you could use uh, to help prevent weeds. Now, you can also try to prevent uh, pest infestations by using row covers. So if you put a row cover over your tender young uh, squashes and cucumbers and pumpkins, that can help deter squash bugs and cucumber beetles and squash fine borers. Or if you put them over your uh, broccoli, your cabbage, and your cauliflower, that can help deter cabbage worms and root mag maggots from attacking um, your brassicas. When you think about dealing with varmints, <laughs> you know, your deer, your rabbits, those kinds of things, you could put up fencing um, to, to keep those things or at least try to keep those things out of your garden. Or you could put bird netting over your blueberry bushes or your raspberry bushes to try to keep the, the birds from picking your berries before you can get to them. So prevention is, is kind of the first weapon that we have at our disposal as we go to war <laughs> against weeds pests, and varmints. The second thing I was thinking about is physical warfare. You know, if you've got some weeds that have kind of made it through the mulch, you, you can pull them, right? You yank them out of the ground, or you could use a cultivator or a hoe um, to physically remove those weeds that have kind of sneaked past your mulch. I remember as a kid, uh, coming to my grandfather, uh, grandfather's house, and we would go out to the potato patch with him, and he would give us a tin can, I believe it had a little bit of kerosene on it, or in it, and uh, we would spend time picking potato bugs off of the potato plants and putting them into that can. I think it was kerosene. Um, I wish he was around for me to ask him, but uh, we would pick those potato bugs. So it was physical warfare. We were picking those bugs off of the plants to keep them um, from eating the potato plants. When it comes to varmints, um, maybe you need to hunt the rabbits or hunt the deer. Um, and I, obviously, keep in mind the local laws. Okay, I'm not advocating that you go out there and uh, it's World War III in your in your garden. Um, but you know, you may need to trap the rabbits, or you may need to shoot some deer or shoot some rabbits. Um, but physical warfare is the second weapon at your disposal. The third weapon available to you is, I'm calling it chemical warfare, right? So herbicides to deal with weeds, fungicides to deal with fungal infections, insecticides to deal with pests, uh, concoctions uh, that you might spray on your plants that would uh, deter uh, the deer or the rabbits because they don't like the smell or the taste. So chemical warfare is number three, the, the third weapon at your disposal. And finally, I'm going to call it trickeration, right? Outsmart, outwit, outlast these pests as they are seeking to invade your garden. Now, honestly, I'm scratching my head to think about how this applies to weeds. So if you have a good analogy on how we could outsmart weeds, let me know. 
<laughs> but this certainly does apply to dealing with pests and varmints. So companion planting is a, is a way that some people will try to deter certain pests from um, attacking the vegetables that they are hoping to harvest. So sometimes people will interplant uh, blue Hubbard squash with cucumbers because something about the blue Hubbard squash, the, the striped cucumber beetles seem to be more attracted to the blue Hubbard squash and the blue Hubbard squash can also seemingly deal with the striped cucumber beetles a little bit better and so your cucumbers can then thrive. Uh, some people will interplant uh, basil and thyme with tomatoes to repel yellow striped armyworms and tomato hornworms. Um, people will use marigolds and plant them around their gardens because marigolds can deter certain kinds of pests. So trickeration, tricking uh, um, the the uh, the pests to to maybe go after something else or using another plant that might deter those pests from coming to your garden at all. And and obviously with varmints, um, the, you know the scarecrow is probably the most obvious example of trickeration. All right, the the old scarecrow that we put out there, um, that kind of looks like uh, you know Farmer Bob in the field, and uh, that hopefully will scare away the deer or or maybe the birds or it will will scare away the the rabbits, um, but some people will also take fake owls and they will put them on fence posts and that will deter some things like uh, your rabbits or or maybe some other birds. Uh, I remember. Um, back in the days of AOL when those CDs used to come in the mail and people had seemingly thousands of them lying around and people would take those and tie them on strings from tree, you know, trees and, and, and maybe fences um, and they would kind of blow around in the wind and that shining, the, the light shining off of those CDs would also serve as a deterrent that would kind of trick those birds or animals from coming into the garden. Um, I've seen people use tin pie plates, uh, the disposable tin pie, pie plates, and uh, hang those around. And as they're blowing in the wind and rattling around, um, that can also discourage varmints and birds from bothering your vegetables. So really, from my, from my perspective, there are four major weapons that you have at your disposal uh, when you're dealing with weeds, pests, and varmints. And that is prevention, physical warfare, chemical warfare, and trickeration. So now you know what weapons you have at your disposal. That's important. But I would say the most important thing is knowing how and when and if to use those weapons. And really, it's the how and the when and the if to use those weapons that perhaps provokes, well, it, it seems to provoke very intense and passionate debates within the homesteading community. And, and maybe only GMOs and what to feed or how to manage your animals results in as much passion and zeal with regards to discussions in online homesteading communities um, as, as, you know, this topic of how to handle pests uh, and weeds and varmints in your garden. In fact, some people really, when it comes to, they, they're very passionate about it, almost to the point of being dogmatic about it. Because this really is when people really start getting into the whole organic approaches to gardening. Now, sometimes as, as someone who is new to gardening, it may be difficult to cut through all of the noise. In fact, uh, as someone who is certainly not new to gardening, I've been doing this for a very, very long time, um, it's still sometimes difficult for me to cut through the noise with regards to some of the stuff. In fact, I shared with you several episodes ago um, about some of the feedback that I got with regards to my Ruth Stout garden bed experiment. And people were telling me how I was doing it wrong, that I should be using straw or wood chips, I shouldn't be using hay. People giving me totally false information with regards to what is the difference between hay and straw. And, and some of them, I'm sure, are very well-meaning. But if I were new to gardening, 
I would be totally confused right now as far as to what I'm doing. Now, I do believe that most of us, uh, I think most of us, I don't think that's an exaggeration, most of us who have started raising and growing our own food, in part we have done that because we have concerns about the chemicals that are used in commercial farming, in big ag. And so I think for, for most of us, uh, the ideal is to use as few chemicals as possible in our gardens, to use as few um, non-natural uh, mulches and so forth in our gardens as possible. Uh, we want to use as much natural mulch. We want to disturb the wildlife in our area as little as possible. But having said all of that, there's the ideal and then there's reality. Now, one of the homesteading, and I follow a lot of homesteading um, YouTube channels, uh, but one of the ones that I really enjoy the most is Co the Cog Hill Farm Channel. And the reason why I really enjoy it so much is because Jason Smith, the guy that runs that channel, takes a very, very practical approach to homesteading. And one of the things that he says over and over again is he reminds his viewers to do the best you can, to do the best you can with what you've got. And I really think that's awesome advice. Do the best you can with what you've got. Remember, we're on a journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. And yes, there's that ideal that we will never ever need to use uh, chemicals, we'll never ever need to use um, uh, you know, non-natural mulches will never need, that's the ideal, but sometimes reality creeps in and then we're faced with difficult decisions. And I think that we just simply need to do the best we can with what we've got. And so if that means for you that you've got to use black plastic as the mulch, because that's what you can get your hands on, and you struggle to find natural mulch in your area for whatever reason, then by all means use black plastic as your mulch. Now there's some, there are some people in the homesteading community that are going to tell you that you're polluting your garden, you're releasing toxins from that plastic into your soil, and because of that plastic somehow you're eventually going to die of some horrible disease. <laughs> but, but folks, I would much rather see you use black plastic as your mulch and grow your own vegetables and raise your own food than for you to continue to buy commercially raised food. I think you're going to be better off using the black plastic and raising your own food. Now, there are those who would tell you that you should never ever use any kind of spray on your plants, even if it's an organic spray. And who knows, maybe they're right, I don't know. But if you're faced with the prospect of totally losing your harvest and instead maybe using an organic or even a conventional spray to deal with a pest infestation is going to allow you to harvest food, then you may decide to spray. That's a decision that you've got to make. And there are those in the community who are going to deride you. They're going to Monday morning armchair quarterback you. They're going to be very dogmatic about their approach to gardening. But what you've got to do is you've got to do the best you can with what you've got. Now, I really think that the best advice I can give you with regards to knowing when to use these weapons and how to use these weapons and if to use these weapons is really for you to seek out gardeners in your local area. You see, people that live where you live are going to know what weeds and what pests and what varmints are most prevalent in your area. And they may have some tips and tricks on how to best or most effectively battle those things. Now certainly I'm not discounting online resources, but I do think that if you can find a local gardening mentor or group, even if they're maybe a bit more, and I'm using huge air quotes here, conventional in their approach, you may be better off than dealing with Joe Blow from Idaho who takes his very dogmatic approach to gardening that is couched in this ideal but is totally detached from reality. 
Now, maybe there's a local gardening club that meets at your library, or maybe there's some master gardener in your area that's going to be willing to mentor you. Maybe there's some little old lady or little old man that lives down the road who uh, would love to share their knowledge with you in exchange for some conversation or some help putting in their garden. Um, but I think that if you can find somebody local to help you understand how and when and if to use these weapons, you're going to be better off. But if you're not able to find a local mentor or a group to help you, then see if you can develop a connection with someone online who takes a pragmatic approach to gardening. Be very, very wary of people who are very dogmatic about their gardening methods. Because just like in any other areas of life, I'm not convinced that there's only one right way to do things. So as we wrap up this series on gardening, I want you to go into your gardening adventure prepared for battle. Understand that you are going to war. <laughs> now, first, first of all, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you are going to be tackling weeds, pests, and varmints. Second, know that you have the weapons of prevention, physical warfare, chemical warfare, and trickeration at your disposal. Don't be afraid to use them. Third, seek out mentors to help you in your gardening journey. The more local, the better. And finally, keep in mind, just do the best you can with what you got. Remember, just like homesteading is a journey, so too is gardening a journey. You're going to make mistakes. Plants are going to die. Crops are going to fail at times. Weeds, pests, and varmints are going to get the best of you. And that's okay. Don't let it discourage you. Don't let it cause you to give up. Try to learn from those failures. And hopefully, this year's garden will be better than last year's garden. And next year's garden will be better than this year's garden. And so on and so forth. So I hope you have found this gardening series helpful. If you have any questions about any of the things that I've said, or maybe there's a topic that you would hope that I would cover that I missed, or maybe you disagree with what I have said. Maybe you disagree with some of my conclusions. I would love to hear from you. Let's talk about it. I certainly could be wrong. I certainly, as I said right from the get-go back in episode number one, I am not an expert. I am on this journey just like you. I am just trying to encourage people along the way. And so if you have some feedback for me, send me an email at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com or contact us on our Facebook uh, site. The link to our Facebook page is in the show notes and we would absolutely love to hear from you. All right, let's end this episode with another great homesteading hack. And this week's homesteading hack is a gardening hack. Now, as I mentioned back in our episode regarding gardening methods, I use the square foot gardening method. And early in the spring, when I am just starting to plant um, my garden beds, I used to really struggle keeping track of which squares I had planted and what I had planted in those squares. Now, I do keep good notes on a piece of paper that I keep on a clipboard, but I don't always carry that out with me to the garden. And so if I'm walking down a row and I want to say, okay, well, what have I planted in this square here? Or have I planted this square as I'm thinking about kind of my next steps? I always struggled keeping track of what was where, unless I had that paper. But I have come up with a really, really easy and cheap way to keep track of that. And it is simply wooden craft sticks. Now, you may know them, them as tongue depressors, but they're just the wider wooden sticks. They're wider than a popsicle stick and they're really, really cheap. I, I got a box of, I think, 300 of them. Well, actually, my wife picked them up at a, at a craft store. I think it was like less than five bucks. I've got 300 of these bad boys. Uh, <laughs> and so I put them in, you know, a handful of them. I will shove in the pocket of my apron with a Sharpie. And when I plan a square, I write down what it is that I put in that square and bam, that goes in the corner. And I do that with my transplant. So I keep track of what tomatoes I have where. And 
as the season goes on, they do deteriorate rather rapidly. They're biodegradable, which is nice. Um, and then they, but th by that point, you kind of know what you've got where because you can kind of look at uh, the the plant, or you can look at the fruit that's being born by that plant. And uh, so I have found that to be very, very helpful, very cheap, a really, really easy hack to help you keep track of what you've planted where in your garden. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, or even if you haven't enjoyed what you've heard, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com or pop on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Homestead Journey Podcast. And if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave us a review on your favorite podcasting platform and also share it with other people that you think might enjoy what we're doing and might be encouraged on their homestead journey. Until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.